page number 36. If you have brought your textbook, then you can come on page number 36, but I will give you all these points in simple words. These are little technical. Give a new heading in your notebook. Companies, auditors, report, order, or it's popularly called as CARO. popularly called as CARO. So we'll make notes on CARO now. Uh, you can say that this topic, this topic nearly comes for five to six marks. But it comes five to six marks. So 40 marks is auditing standards that we have prepared five marks for CARO. So if you study this much and go, your 45 marks syllabus is done. That's how, you know, we'll accumulate marks now. So, companies, auditors, report, order. Companies, auditors, report, order. Shall I start? Please give the heading first. Now pay attention. What we have to understand in Caro 2003. See this order, this order has been made applicable with effect from 1st of July 2003. This order has been, now you don't have to see the textbook, I just told you to write the title, rest all things we'll understand with simple notes. So this order is made applicable with effect from 1st of July 2003. Why are we studying this order? What's the reason for studying CARO? Basically, this order, this order is meant only for statutory auditors. This order is meant only for statutory auditors. Internal auditors never make use of this order. So this order is only meant for statutory auditors, not for internal auditors. If you are an internal auditor, you need not prepare a CARO report. Okay, you need not prepare a CARO report. Statutory auditors main objective, statutory auditors main objective is to express an opinion on financial statements. The main objective of statutory auditors is to express an opinion on financial statements whereas the main objective of an internal auditor, the main objective of an internal auditor is to find out the strengths and weaknesses of internal control system. This is the main reason why we do statutory audits, this is the main reason why we do internal audits. So statutory auditors main objective is to express an opinion, internal auditors main objective is to find out the strength and weaknesses. I think you've heard about SWOT analysis, the yes, strengths weaknesses analysis. So this is strengths weaknesses of internal control system. Now what is the need for statutory auditors to prepare this report? The statutory auditors when they report, of course statutory auditors always report to the shareholders. Okay, to the stakeholders, to the shareholders, their reports are given. Whereas these internal auditors always report to the management. So the report of an internal auditor is always meant for the management, whereas the report for a stat auditor is meant for the shareholders. Prior to 2003, prior to 2003, it was found that the report of statutory auditor was not conveying adequate meaning. Prior to 2003, it was found that the report of stat auditor was not conveying adequate meaning. That means when a stat auditor used to give his audit report, that size of audit report, the size of audit report was just one page audit report. 
And you know, that time, prior to 2003, there was only one SA which was applicable for these audits, and this was SA 700. And you know, this uh, qualified opinion, disclaimer, and adverse opinion, they were also part of SA 700 only, old SA 700. So that then what happened, SA 700 got revised, and by 2012, we are studying a new SA 700 and an SA 705. So SA 705 contains uh, unqualified, uh, SA 705 contains qualified adverse and disclaimer, whereas SA 700 contains only unqualified opinion. But prior to 2003, everything was part of, forming part of this SA 700 only. And this, this was just a one page audit report which an auditor used to prepare. It was not conveying adequate meaning. Then there was a need for a shareholder to understand the audit report a little better, but he could not do so. He, even if he was a, the, even if the shareholder was a chartered accountant, he was finding it very difficult to understand. A auditor just writes to and fair view, but for from what basis you're writing to and fair view? Do you have? I I keep on telling you all. Do you have sufficient grounds to give your opinion? Okay. So if you don't have sufficient grounds, on what grounds you're writing to and fair view? People felt that okay, there is a desperate need to get out with something, to come out with something which can resolve this problem. Just by writing true and fair view I am not conveying any meaning for my audit report so then what happened was happened with effect from 1st of July 2003 with effect from 1st of July 2003 only for companies only for companies so suppose if you are appointed as an auditor of a company you had to prepare a company's auditors report order which is popularly called as CARO this order CARO this order CARO will now be annexed to the main audit report this order caro will now be annexed to the main audit report so it was like an annexure it was like an attachment to the main audit report okay in the simple words annex means i am going to attach something to my main audit report and this order spoke about this order spoke about clauses not one not two but 21 clauses okay all the 21 clauses will not apply to one single company. So suppose whatever clauses would apply, an auditor would always speak on only those applicable clauses. Okay. So this statutory audit report was given in which he used to write true and fair view. But a statutory auditor always had reasons to support his opinion. Why is he writing true and fair view? What was the reason? So used to the shareholder or the person who was interested more in the audit report used to go and he used to see this CARO report. And in the CARO report, each and every clause used to go and read the caro report starts from small roman number one and it ends up to small roman number 21 this is how clauses will be numbered okay even in the textbooks like you know in the textbooks also they print uh, the bigger roman bigger roman numbers or maybe the actual integer numbers we don't write like this in caro we always write small roman numbers small roman number one to 21 one one clause we will discuss in detail you can't even change the numbering of these clauses because all these clauses are to be numbered in the same manner as it is that means suppose to one company clause number one is not applicable so you just have to write in front of clause number one not applicable you can't say then two will become one you can't change the ordering okay ordering has to be same only this many chartered accountants don't know they make mistake they write two as one and one you know they just remove it and they write two as one or they may write 21 as 20 and because in between one clause was not applicable so it's not like that 21 will always remain as clause 21 only that is how caro report needs to be presented this was the reason why caro report was presented now when i say caro to which type of companies is caro applicable one of the recently asked questions in ipcc paper it was asked for eight marks okay and for eight marks student had to write only five or six lines to get that eight marks but only thing is you should know what you have to write in five or six lines so it was recently asked in november 13 paper explain the kind of companies to whom caro shall apply so i'm writing here applicability of caro okay caro will be applicable to what type of companies ipcc question now when i say first of all caro caro will be applicable to all the companies caro will be applicable to all the companies if such companies are public companies caro will be applicable to all the companies if such companies are public companies so if you are a public company then caro shall apply to you not only a public company including including if you are a foreign company then also caro shall be applicable to you now sir uh, can you please explain us all these things what is a foreign company what's a public company suppose let us start with a foreign company first if I have to understand what's a foreign company it is very simple to understand in India in India suppose if a foreign company has a 
branch. Suppose if a company is incorporated, if a company is incorporated in USA, okay, but in India it has a branch. In India it has a branch, or in India it has an office, okay, office. Or I would like to say, I would like to say that in India, if that company, if that company has a place of business. If that company has a place of business. Any company which is incorporated, any company which is incorporated outside India, any company which is incorporated outside India but it has a place of business in India, then such company for the definition of India will be called as a for the purpose of India, we will call it as what? Foreign company. So actually speaking, foreign company has its registration done outside India, but it operates in India. Apple is the biggest example of foreign company operating in India. Apple has so many branches in India. Apple has so many offices in India. So Apple is supposed to be, for India, Apple is supposed to be a foreign company. Now what I mean to say, tell you all here is that to if you are an auditor for say suppose this branch also suppose you now sir the rule is that how can an Indian CA how can a CA who is an Indian CA become an auditor of a, a foreign company what I mean to tell you all here is that a person who is an Indian CA cannot do audit of this holding company which is located in USA but so this this arrow is not allowed but he can very well be the auditor of what this company which is having a branch in India so you can be appointed as a branch branch auditor of this foreign company okay there is no harm in that suppose if you want to do a audit of this office of apple you can be appointed as an auditor for that company but you cannot be an auditor for the holding company which is incorporated outside india so a person who is doing audit of a foreign company in india is generally doing audit of what the place of business of that foreign company in india that means your audit report your indian audit report will be of course filed with the roc but it will be only meant for that branch because this apple has branch all across the globe in the whole world it has branch. it has branch in germany it has branch in china it has branch in all the parts of australia everywhere apple is located but when i'm telling you in india, for the purpose of india india apple is a foreign company so uh, an, an indian ca can only become auditor of the branch he cannot become auditor of a holding company if you want to appoint a person to be an auditor of a holding company he has to be a certified public accountant from that country only where this company is incorporated and not an Indian CA an Indian CA cannot be an auditor of the holding company he can only be an auditor of the place of business of that foreign company that is the definition so sir if this CA does the audit will he be required to prepare a CARO report he will he prepare the CARO report answer will be yes because to these type of companies also CARO shall be applicable so answer is yes he will, uh, sir, what about this uh, public company where a CA, you know, is being doing audit? So can a CA prepare an uh, audit report for a public company? Now, first of all, how do you understand what's a public company? Let me give you a small example to understand the definition of public company. Public company, according to the Companies Act, is that company which is not a private company. That means our job is to understand what's a private company. Okay. Now, if I read the articles of association of a private company, if I just read the articles of association of a private company, I come to a conclusion that in the articles, it is very clearly written that a private company cannot come out with an initial public offer. That means a private company cannot issue shares to the public. A private company cannot issue debentures to the public. Okay. A private company cannot accept public deposits a private company cannot accept loans from public not accept loans from public that means you can't actively deal with public in any circumstances since you cannot do all these activities that means you are which type of company you're a private company and whereas a public company can do all these things that is why it is called as a public company that's a literal definition of when you read the companies act old or whether you read the companies act new in both the company law this definition is written so basically there are other points also to discuss but i am not conducting a lecture on private and public company my job is 
to first tell you that why are we preparing a Caro report? We are preparing a Caro report as of now just to understand that we are going to prepare a Caro report for a public company. That means any company which is a public company means it is not a private company. So sir, what's a private company? A private company has so many restrictions from its articles of association. Sir, what is articles of association means? Articles of association means the rules and regulations of a company. Do you know that articles of association should be always known to the directors of the company? Unless these people don't know the articles, how are they going to monitor? How are they going to govern the company? So these people should be aware of the articles of associations. Whereas the memorandum of association should be always known to the shareholders okay so whenever the company has issued any article the articles of association should be conveyed to the directors you know when i convey any article when i convey any article to the director it is called as doctrine of indoor management what is it called as doctrine of indoor management that means if you are conveying anything to a director do you know who's going who's who prepares these articles of association generally the promoters of the company who float the company prepare the articles and memorandum random and promoters of course are not that knowledgeable people they have knowledge about the business but they don't know how to write the article so they take help of the experts like CS and CA so CS and CA help the promoter to make the articles drafting to get the memorandum of association printed and then it is conveyed to the directors of the company and once it is conveyed to the directors later on you can differentiate whether a company is a private company whether a company is a public company so if the public company it's, it's a public company then all these restrictions won't be there for a public company because these are restrictions only meant for a private company so sir should we prepare a caro report for a public company also answer is yes okay so any company which is a public company yes you have to prepare a caro report any company which is a foreign company yes you have to prepare a caro report Sir, why are we not supposed to prepare a Caro report for a private company? I'll come to your point also. First, you tell me, have you understood these two points? What did I say that you have to prepare a Caro report for a public company and a foreign company? What are these two companies that also I have explained you? Now, what I want to explain you all here is that to which type of companies is Caro not applicable? So, there is something called as non-applicability of Caro. You won't believe it, but institute gives more importance to non-applicability rather than giving importance to applicability of caro so when i'm saying non-applicability of caro to which type of companies caro shall not apply caro shall not apply to those type of companies which are called as banking companies now sir what is the difference between a normal company and a banking company a banking company is always monitored and regulated under the rbi provisions in fact they are they have a different style of making balance sheet and profit and loss account which is not covered by the schedule number 3 of the companies act in fact it is covered by schedule number 3 of the banking regulation act 1949 okay the banks prepare their profit and loss account and balance sheet as per schedule number 3 not of the companies act schedule number 3 of the banking regulation act 1949 so that is why we are not going to cover or we are not going to make car report these companies have a totally different format their shareholder style is different their operating structure is different everything is different for them so caro is only applicable to those type of companies which are incorporated and registered under the companies act earlier it was 1956 now it is 2013 okay so 1956 or 2013 if you are registered as a company only then you shall prepare a caro for that company so if you are an auditor of a bank would you go and prepare a car report for a bank answer is no because these companies are not there is nowhere written in the banking regulations that a banking company has to prepare a caro report you know why is that so because the auditors report are very much conveying they are meaningful audit reports whereas in the companies act the auditors report is just one page audit report it does not conveys anything that that is why it need arises to put a an extra report to put a supplementary report whereas if i see the if i show you the bank audit report the bank audit reports are thick bank audit report you go to website of any bank say you go to website of state bank of india just type there concurrent audit reports or bank audit reports you will get big big fat bank audit reports to see on google okay and you can just read two or three points of course you will not follow anything but you read it you understand something try to gain some knowledge out of it you will come to a conclusion that the reports are very much meaningful and there is absolutely no need for such companies to make
make a caro report so remember caro reports are only made for those type of companies where an auditor is doing an audit and it is just a company it is not a banking company nor it is an insurance company nor it is an insurance company so to insurance companies also caro c a r o does not applies it is not applicable because insurance companies are again monitored by i r e D A okay I R D A so I R D A means Insurance Regulatory and Development Authority is popularly called as what I R D A Insurance Regulatory and Development Authority and these companies these companies have to prepare their audit reports and their annual accounts as per the I R D A Act 1999 okay so again their audit reports their formats are totally conveying their meaningful audit reports so the need does not arises to prepare a caro report for such companies so caro reports will not be prepared if you are an auditor of a banking company if you are an auditor of an insurance company there is one more company which is called as section 25 companies as per the companies act 1956 section 25 companies sir what do you mean by section 25 companies they are pro properly they are actually they are called as what non profit organization do you know that their business is more of a charity business okay their business is more of a charity business charity business means what they don't have to give answer to the even the shareholder who is investing in a non profit organization knows that he is going to get nothing in return okay he is going to get nothing in return so the shareholder does not anticipates any dividends from such company since the shareholder does not anticipates any dividends from such companies there is no need again if you are a commercial company if you are a profit oriented company you will have to prepare a caro report if you are non commercial company caro does not applies to you so these are reasons i am telling you why you are not going to prepare a caro report and of course by reading reading all these points one thing is very clear that caro is only applicable to those companies which are answerable to shareholders and which are dealing amongst the shareholders at large that means if you are interacting with shareholders only then and that is only one form of company which is public company so to public companies caro shall apply of course foreign companies a foreign company there is no restriction if you prepare a caro report so you have to prepare a caro report whereas there are certain restrictions here you will ask me a question that sir you are talking something about a private company whether to prepare a caro report for a private company or not the answer will be yes if you will prepare but it is subject to it is subject to one two three conditions there are three conditions which you have to follow here for a private company there are how many conditions there are three conditions which you have to follow if you want to prepare a caro report condition number 1 if the paid up share capital plus reserves and surplus so what do you mean by paid up share capital what is this paid up share capital paid up share capital can be equity share capital or it can be preference share capital both taken together so if the paid up share capital of such company if the paid up share capital of such company plus its reserves and surplus plus its reserves and surplus <laughs> so do we have to take all the reserves and surplus answer is yes you have to take revenue reserves as well as you have to take capital reserves okay revenue plus capital take all the reserves add them with plus the paid up share capital now if the total comes to if the total comes to more than more than equal to 50 lakh rupees then you will have to prepare caro report answer will be yes but if you have to write your answer as no it means that the paid up share capital should not exceed 50 lakh rupees so if it is exceeding 50 lakh rupees or if it is equal to 50 lakh rupees you will have to prepare a caro report for such company once again once again what we are going to do we are going to decide whether we have to prepare a caro report for a private company so when will the answer come as yes subject to the satisfaction of these three conditions what was the first condition the paid up share capital plus reserves and surplus should be more than equal to 50 lakh rupees for you to prepare a caro report and and means the second condition should also be fulfilled the second condition will be loans if such private company has taken loans loans can be taken from banks loans can be taken from financial institutions or loans can be in the nature of unsecured loans okay so if such private company has taken loans from unsecured loans banks or financial institution and if the value of the loan is more than equal to 25 lakh rupees half of 50 lakhs very easy to remember half of 50 lakh 25 lakh rupees then you will have to prepare a caro report for the same 
yes when i've written as yes it means it should exceed or should be equal to 25 lakh rupees but if i say the third condition the third condition will be the turnover condition so what do you mean by turnover turnover means sales sales but with sales sales will include all the net sales net sale means what it will be total of your cash sales plus total of your credit sales minus the discount and minus the sales returns and minus the taxes all these things you remove from the sale whatever is the amount remaining here this will be called as what net sale so when i'm talking about sales sales means net sale if the net sales of this company is more than equal to rupees 5 crores 5 cr 5 crores okay remember 5 CRs then only it has to prepare cover report and what I've written here I've written and 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 here that means what all these conditions are cumulative in nature they are not mutually exclusive they are cumulative conditions so we have to see the satisfaction of these conditions only then we have to decide whether to prepare a cover report or not sir give example suppose if the turnover was 7 crore rupees of a private company and its paid up share capital was 49 lakhs plus reserves and surplus 49 lakhs and plus loans uh, were amounting to 24 lakh rupees only should we prepare a caro report or not what is the answer no. answer will be no have you understood or not that means you have to decide here by looking in, into all these conditions uh, just one more thing which I want to say here when I'm talking about reserves and surplus when I'm talking about reserves and surplus reserves and surplus would always mean those reserves which are revenue reserves and those reserves which are capital reserves but one more thing which I want to add here is that when I'm talking about reserves and surplus suppose if you see a profit and loss account debit balance do you know what does it means is it a profit or is it a loss so it's a loss so this loss will have to be deducted from reserves and surplus okay that means reserves and surplus will not include this profit and loss account balance if you're preparing a caro report so remember in the balance sheet if you have a profit and loss account balance then it has to be deducted but sir from which reserve i have to deduct the profit and loss you can deduct this profit and loss account debit balance only from the profit and loss account credit balance you can't deduct it from any capital reserve you can't use a fixed asset revaluation reserve to you know set off the profit and loss account debit balance you cannot use any capital type of reserve you cannot use the securities premium account to set off this type of reserve you can only use the profit and loss account credit balance to set off the profit and loss account debit balance and after that decide whether you have to prepare caro report or not so tell me tell me if i am telling you that when we are talking about all these conditions uh, if these conditions are full filled only then you'll have to prepare a caro report for a private company otherwise you don't have to prepare the caro report have you understood or not now i'll repeat all these conditions once again whenever we are talking about caro report remember one thing that caro should be prepared only when a company is a public company when a company is a foreign company but it should not be prepared if a company is a banking company it's an insurance company section 25 company or a private company private company subject to the fulfillment of three conditions tell me if all these three conditions are satisfied that means suppose if these three conditions less than equal to 50 lakhs less than 50 lakhs less than 25 lakhs and less than 5 crore rupees will you prepare a caro report you won't prepare a caro report have you understood or not or is it clear or not everyone shall we write on all these points please Liko, start writing Shh. why you're talking you want to go home early or not First point, CARO, CARO, CARO is an annexure report, CARO is an annexure report, is an annexure report, annexure report, which is attached along with, which is attached along with, attached along with, the statutory auditor's report 
along with the statutory auditor's report. Full stop. Next point. Caro contains 21 clauses. Caro contains 21 clauses which are reported by statutory auditors which are reported by statutory auditors reported by statutory auditors if these clauses are applicable if these clauses are applicable to a company applicable to a company full stop next point caro shall be prepared for caro shall be prepared for all public companies and all foreign companies all public companies and all foreign companies full stop next point caro is not applicable caro is not applicable is not applicable to a banking company to a banking company to an insurance company to an insurance company to a section 25 company section 25 company and to a private company to a private company subject to the fulfillment subject to the fulfillment of the following three conditions of the following three conditions so condition number a first condition a small a the paid up share capital the paid up share capital plus reserves and surplus the paid up share capital plus reserves and surplus does not exceeds 50 lakh rupees does not exceeds 50 lakh rupees and condition number B loans from banks loans from banks or financial institutions loans from banks or financial institutions including unsecured loans including unsecured loans does not exceeds does not exceeds 25 lakh rupees does not exceeds 25 lakh rupees and condition number c condition c the net turnover the net turnover does not exceeds 5 crore rupees does not exceeds 5 crore rupees now i'll give you some notes from beginning till now whatever i have made you write was asked in ipcc 8 marks question okay so you mark all these things as important ipcc generally they ask only so much of caro but we will not study so much we'll go into details now you write certain notes there notes notes note number one 
पेड अप शेयर कैपिटल इज इक्वल टू इक्विटी प्लस प्रेफरेंस पेड अप शेयर कैपिटल पेड अप शेयर कैपिटल इज इक्वल टू इक्विटी प्लस प्रेफरेंस इक्विटी प्लस प्रेफरेंस नोट नंबर सेकेंड टर्न ओवर मीन्स टर्न ओवर मीन्स कैश प्लस क्रेडिट सेल्स कैश प्लस क्रेडिट सेल्स less sales returns less sales returns less discounts less duties and taxes less duties and taxes note number 3 if the paid up share capital if the paid up share capital is exactly equal to 50 lakhs if the paid up share capital is exactly equal to 50 lakhs don't prepare cargo report exactly equal to 50 lakhs don't prepare cargo report likewise likewise if the loans are exactly 25 lakhs don't prepare caro report don't prepare caro report full stop the balance of paid up share capital the balance of paid up share capital and loans the balance of paid up share capital and loans is to be seen is to be seen at the closing of the year not the opening uh, at the closing of the year the balance of paid up share capital and loans is to be seen at the closing of the year note number how many notes you wrote Three. note number 4 reserves and surplus is equal to reserves and surplus is equal to reserves and surplus is equal to all reserves all reserves that is capital as well as revenue reserves that is capital as well as revenue reserves less the debit balance of profit and loss account less the debit balance of profit and loss account into bracket please write down after you wrote that debit balance of profit and loss account in bracket write down the debit balance can be only offset with the credit balance the debit balance of profit and loss account can be only offset can be only offset offset with the credit balance of profit and loss account Full stop. The fixed asset revaluation reserve there only. Continue. The fixed asset revaluation reserve will also be considered. Fixed asset revaluation reserve will also be considered. even if it is unrealized profits even if it is unrealized profits i hope you know what is realized what is unrealized so when you revalue your fixed asset and if there is an upward revaluation then you create which reserve fixed asset revaluation so even if it is unrealized still you will add the fixed asset reserve so i am telling you each and everything 
that no doubt should be there in your mind. Next point. Turnover, turnover should be seen. Turnover should be seen at any point of time during the year. Turnover should be seen at any point of time at any point of time during the year at any point of time during the year for example for example if a company is operating if a company is operating only for two months in a year only for two months in a year that is it is a seasonal business company it's a seasonal business company if it's a seasonal business company and if the turnover of and if the turnover of one month if it's a seasonal business company and the turnover of one month or both the months or both the months does not exceeds 5 crore rupees does not exceeds 5 crore rupees then no caro report shall be prepared no caro report shall be prepared Tell me, Caro has how many points? Okay, we'll have to discuss one by one, so please pay attention. Now, if you allow me to speak for some time, I will allow you to go fast, otherwise I'll make you sit. Clause number one. Fixed assets. Clause number one is on fixed assets. Pay attention. Whenever a statutory auditor writes true and fair view in his statutory audit report, whenever a statutory auditor writes true and fair view, he should always write this point in Caro that as far as fixed assets are concerned, they are being physically verified. And these Physically verified fixed assets are being physically verified by its management. The management is doing physical verification and physical verification is happening on a regular basis. Management has maintained full records including the important one, the fixed asset register. I think today only I was telling you that it took one 30 days, one month full to verify one fixed asset register if the management changes its method of charging depreciation. is that big. It takes, reality is like that only. What you see here and when you practically do it, there is a remarkable difference. So, fixed asset register has to be there for fixed assets. So, as an auditor, you have to verify the fixed asset register. Shh, there, please pay attention. The auditor has to verify the fixed asset register to see whether the fixed assets which are recorded in the register actually tally with the fixed assets which are physically present or not. Then, you have to always see one thing, which is the most important point in Caro. Uh, there's something called as going concern assumption. So this going concern is so a concern for us. It always comes, you know. So now it's going concern assumption. You know what does this uh, this point means for Caro? Whenever there is a substantial disposal, whenever there is a substantial disposal of fixed asset, tell me who will decide whether to dispose of fixed asset or not. You all know it is board of directors. So if according to an auditor's professional judgment, when there is substantial disposal. Sir, give example. What do you mean by substantial disposal? Substantial disposal, suppose if a company has fixed assets worth 100 crore rupees. In the morning I told you out of 100 crores, 2 crores were disposed of, 98 crores were still there. Is this substantial disposal? 
you will everybody will apply their professional judgment and say no sir it's not substantial disposal then sir what does it mean substantial disposal means something where suppose out of 170 crores are disposed of 30 crores are only remaining now it is substantial disposal so some auditors will say yes some auditors will say substantial disposal means out of 100 when 90 are sold only 10 is remaining now it is substantial disposal I am trying to project various examples in front of you just to tell you that it is your professional judgment to decide what amounts to substantial disposal or not. Suppose by disposing 70 crores of fixed assets out of 100 crores, the production capacity came down from 1000 units to 800 units. That means even with 30 crores of fixed asset, you can still manufacture 800 units. Then I don't think so, it should be called as substantial disposal. So substantial disposal means from 1000 crore, from 1000 units per annum, you can just make now 10 or 100 units per annum now it is reduction in the production capacity now it is amounting to substantial disposal so what is substantial disposal or not again i'm telling you it's very dicey to write answers for such type of question is again the matter of auditors professional judgment so if an auditor applies his professional judgment and concludes that he is amounting to substantial disposal then he should write this point in caro report because substantial disposal can lead to affecting the concept of going concern okay whatever i explained just now is what is written here we can have a look at the points how many clauses as i told you there are 21 clauses let's see the first one wherever you know it is highlighted i have um, what is important to be written i have highlighted with the bold color so you will pay attention on that every management has to maintain proper records including quantitative details and situations of fixed asset what does it mean how many fixed assets you have one two three four that is quantitative detail where are they located one is located in the warehouse one is located in the factory and one is located in the office so situation where it is located location you have to describe physical verification of fixed assets should be conducted by the management at the reasonable intervals that means in sufficient uh, time period only you have to conduct the fixed asset should not wait for 31st march to come only then you will conduct the verification it's not like that if there are any material discrepancies material discrepancies means what sir material discrepancy means errors okay if there are any material discrepancies that means the records are not telling with the physical assets then the auditor has to make sure that they should be easily rectified okay they should be properly dealt with dealt with means what they should be rectified and if substantial part of fixed assets has been disposed of whether it affects the going concern assumption should be notified by an auditor that means all these points if they are there that means if management is not doing physical verification right in caro if management has disposed of sufficient portion of fixed asset right in caro i don't tell you that all these conditions should be there see many people don't understand this also i am not saying that all these conditions should be written if any one condition is not present you have to write that point only you don't have to write all the other conditions here so suppose if i say that the management is maintaining books of accounts of fixed assets properly and there are no material discrepancies no material discrepancies should you write that thing in caro no you should not write it if there are material discrepancies only then you have to write in caro if the going concern assumption is affected only then you have to mention in caro because if you're writing that the going concern assumption is affected how you can write true and fair view in your main audit report are you getting this point then it will be contradictory one place you're writing true and fair view and in the caro report you're writing going concern assumption is affected so the two are not telling so both should be agreeing on the same point or if you are not writing that then you should mention that according to us us means we are the auditors i should not say according to me if i say according to me then i'm talking informally i have to talk formally with the client i have to talk formally you know when we are writing caro reports and uh, letters of engagement we have to always speak in the third person not in the first and the second person always talk in the third person that means you have to talk in the active voice now don't tell me teach active voice and passive voice also okay what I'm trying to say, it should be mostly formal method of communication. So when I'm saying formal, suppose if you feel that the substantial part of fixed assets has not been disposed of, you can write that thing. That according to us, substantial portion is not disposed of. Therefore, we are giving a true and fair view. And if you feel that the substantial portion is disposed of, then you say that due to substantial disposal of fixed asset, the concept of going concern gets affected. Tell me if the concept of going concern gets affected, which is the only opinion you can give? <laughs> adverse opinion. Have you understood or not? So in your audit report, write adverse opinion and here you will have the reason for the same. So the shareholder can relate the points. What you are mentioning there, is what is written in the caro report have you understood or not i want people to read that first point page number 36 read that point properly <laughs> have you read it okay anything you have not followed have you followed this 
Okay, if the point comes, can you write in exam? Remember one thing, I will be starting uh, with, as soon as I finish Karo, I'll be starting with uh, a small topic called as vouching and verification. Now, uh, or I may do some other chapter, but when you get questions on vouching and verification, remember one thing, you can always write these points in vouching and verification. It is very uh, much, you know, same, similar to vouching and verification. Rather than learning two, two or three points again and again, the same repetitive points, I'm telling you that you can always write somewhere in the, the notes only that this Karo uh, points can be also written along with a chapter called as vouching and verification. You know what is the weightage of that chapter? It comes for 15 marks and Karo comes for 5 marks. That means what preparation we are doing is actually for 20 marks it's going on. Okay, so you can write somewhere in the corner there that these points can be also written along with vouching and verification. Then don't come and ask me that sir vouching verification same point that also same point should we write it or not. I'm telling you write it the same point can be written in vouching and verification also. All these points. So suppose if they ask you how to verify inventory, these same points can be written with vouching and verification of inventory also. These points, you should write there as a note, these points should be written for vouching and verification also. So it will enhance the credibility of your answers. Next point. Next point is on inventory. Now what do I say about inventory? I have already taught you SA501. You remember SA501? Go to SA501 and see the part A of SA501. Inventory should be verified by the management. Stock register should be maintained. Valuation should be as per AS2. No material discrepancy should be there. Exactly same point. Read that 501 also and read the second point here. Read 501 inventory and read this point together. Okay, next point. Now this third point of Caro, it's difficult to understand, so look here. It speaks on loans, whether it is unsecured loans or whether it is secured loans, both are covered. Whether it is unsecured loans or whether it is secured loans, both are covered. So in the exam, if they give you a question, you should not worry because I am talking about both the type of loans, secured and unsecured loans. These loans are given, these loans are given. There are two concepts here. One is loans given and another one is loans taken. The company for whom you are the car auditor has given a loan to a party who is covered under section 301 of the 1956 act. The company for which you are doing the audit, you are the Caro auditor, that means Caro is applicable to that company, has given loans to these people who are covered under section 301. Sir, who are these people who are covered under section 301? These people are called as related parties. First you understand what I am saying, the company for which you are the Caro auditor, that means we are going to decide to prepare a Caro report for this company. This company has given loans, has given loans whether secured or unsecured, anything to a party who is covered under section 301 of the Companies Act 1956. So what is this 301? Explain. Suppose, now this example will make your concept very easy, but otherwise this concept is not that easy. The section 301, if you read, it's not easy at all. This section is on directors. Section 301 of the Companies Act 1956, not 2013, 1956 is on directors. If there is a company in which Mr. A, Mr. A is a director. Suppose, let us take, he's a managing director of A Limited. The same Mr. A is a manager of B Limited. Sir, is it possible that one person can be a manager here and managing director here? Answer is yes. As per the Companies Act, one person can hold managerial positions in 20 companies. Earlier it was 15, now it's become 20. With 2013 Act, now you can have 20 positions. 
that means you can be directors and managers at managerial level not the manager of purchase manager no that not that manager managerial level manager okay in how many companies sir which companies you are counting here is it private company is it public company i'm only talking about public companies here that means sir suppose if a mr a wants to become director of 80 private companies can he do so yes provided he has that much ability to manage 80 private companies okay you will faint but if you are a having the so there is no bar or there is no restriction on private companies it's only restriction on public companies so suppose if there are two companies a limited and b limited a is a md here and a is a managerial level person here in b limited now this company a limited is wanting to sell something and that same thing what it's wanting to sell this company wants to purchase that thing now this person is having an idea that this person is having an idea this a limited wants to sell and b limited wants to purchase something neither b knows a nor a knows b but both of them know mr a now mr a thought why not to make some gains here since i am an md here and since I am the manager here, let's make some profits, okay? Undisclosed profits. Who will come to know all these points? The shareholders are not coming and seeing what I am doing inside the company. So what did Mr. A do? Mr. A told to A Limited that, sir, if you want to sell something to the management of A Limited, as, as, as such, I am the managing director. So the, mostly the management is going to listen to me. He told to A Limited that I have a person who is going to buy in bulk from you, okay? But then the, you should pay me some proportion of that transaction as a percentage commission are you ready to a limited was in desperate need to remove this article it was well willing to sell this article it was not finding a buyer like so see he's taking the advantage of the complexity of the situation you can only make profits when the situations are complex more the risk more the returns so he was following that policy he told to be limited do you want to purchase this material be limited say i'm desperately looking for a person i'm not getting a person who's going to sell this material so then a limited a mr a told that can you give me some proportion of your sale price as a percentage commission b said okay sir i will so suppose b promised three percent this uh, this person promised two and a half percent now section 301 of the companies act says that whenever transactions happen this type of transactions happen sell purchase etc you have to maintain records for those transactions you know who's going to maintain the record? The company secretary is going to maintain those records. Just like how company secretary makes the minutes book. The company sec I will teach you resolutions now. In the next lecture, I'll teach you resolutions. Resolutions are also written by company secretaries. Company secretaries draft the memorandum and articles. Now the company secretaries are also maintaining these records. So the company secretary will record these transactions. That means company secretary should be also as honest as an auditor only. Even company secretaries can be bribed easily. So he has to be as honest as the audit. He should be a person of integrity. Okay, honesty. So now this company secretary will record that Mr. A has taken 2%, 2.5% commission from A and 3% commission from B and therefore the transaction took place. Do you know that these records are open to inspection to the members of the company? Any member of a company can come and inspect these records. Sir, who can be the member of a company? Can you give some examples? Who are the members of the company? Anyone can be a member of a company. That is a definition. Anyone. Sir, so example. If a person is having shares, by default he is a member. If a person's name is written in the company's memorandum of association, do you know that in the MOA there are many, many clauses? There is a capital clause, there is a name clause, there is an object clause, there is a liability clause, and the la there is one more clause which is called as subscription clause which clause subscription clause do you know what you mean by subscription when you form a new company when you form a new company you have to introduce some capital suppose if you formed a company and that time you were not having any shareholders the directors and the promoters who form the company they only put their capital in the company that means their name will be written in the subscription clause subscription clause means the clause which comprises of the first subscribers of the company they are the first subscribers who made the company later on you may have 10,000 shareholders coming in your company later on not now at the time of floating the company these two or three people who put their own money they are they are called as the initial subscribers of the company 
so their name will be written in the memorandum of association and do you know that memorandum of association is also subject to alteration you can change each and every clause of memorandum but not the subscription clause subscription clause can never be altered in the life of the whole company as long as the so if tata is going to survive for 178 years the subscription clause will remain exactly the same as it was before 178 years rest all clauses can be changed memorandum of association is also subject to alteration except which clause <laughs> subscription so suppose if my name comes in the subscription clause even i am the i may not have shares of the company but still i am the member if a person sells goods to creditors uh, sorry if a creditor sells goods to a company if a creditor sells goods to a company and the creditor wants his name to be written in the register of members of the company even creditor's name can come in the register of members of the company if the creditor pays fees to the company now you will always ask me a question why will a creditor who is selling goods to a company will pay some fees to become the member of the company suppose if i am telling you that i am a creditor of reliance industries i go to a bank i will tell to company that i am a creditor of reliance industries do you know that company oh you sell goods to reliance industries also oh oh okay that is an impression i am creating on the bank if i tell to uh, say one or two banks that i am selling goods to birla i am selling goods to hindustan unilever i am selling goods to reliance industries all big companies are there in my profile i may not have even one share of such companies but i may just be paying fees to such companies so that they continue writing my name in their register of members every company has to maintain a members register once you become a ca ica maintains a register of members likewise every company maintains register of members so if you pay fees to a company for becoming its members even then you are member though you may not be having even a single share of the company there are many many ways by which you can become members of the company and sir who can become members of the company anyone can become member that means what why did i take you to this point because this person this person whose name is written by this company secretary in this record even a creditor can come and he can check the register of members what is this person doing and if the creditor comes to know he may blow a whistle to the shareholders the shareholder will start beating that director how can you take commission you are a director of the company that does not mean that you will not disclose these transactions this is called as maintaining transparency you know tell me how much do you rely on an auditor and how much work he is going to check there has to be someone who should support the auditor that someone is a what he will do he will record all these transaction in the records in the register of members and these records are open to the members for inspection sir can i go and inspect the records if i am the member of course you just have to pay fees to the company do you know for checking two lines you have to pay 1 rupee 1 rupee is the fee that means if you check one if you pay 1 rupees you will be allowed to see two lines which are relevant for you So suppose if I just want to see these two lines, I have to pay. Suppose if I want to see four lines, I have to pay two rupees to the company, nominal fee. But you have to pay the fee so that you you are allowed to go and see what's happening inside. Once you see the record, if you come to know this point that the director is acquiring commission on a commission basis, he is working personal gains. Then this, you know, in this type of transaction, in the A and B limited transaction which I explained you, I will call that director as a related party please understand i am not defining related party so far what i have defined for you all i am not defining that related party as per sa 550 or as per as 18 i am defining related party as per section 301 of the companies act this definition is radically different from the definition which you have studied so far with me this definition has nothing to do with the related party definition which you have studied in fact if you read some company law textbooks they they say it's related party other textbook may also say that such type of directors are called as interested directors who are they interested they have an interest in the transaction one wants to sell other wants to buy so this director is gaining commission from both so he is an interested director if a company for which you are the caro auditor gives a loan gives a loan to its interested director or gives a loan to a director who is a related director then in that case an auditor has to see in that case an auditor has to see whether the principal money plus the interest amount has been repaid by the director to the company or not whether it has been repaid by the director to the company or not why is that so the director just can't keep on taking loan from the company a day will come where the working capital will be shortage for a company company will not have even money to meet its day to day operations because all the money it has given to its directors only then company will go to bank for loan 
higher the loan more than the equity you will be having a problem of financial leverage your going concern gets affected so it is because of this reason whenever we give loans to any of the parties who are mentioned in section number 301 who are these section 301 parties they are called as interested directors related parties so when we are giving loan to such party auditor has to see whether the loan has been repaid by this party or not because these are very closely connected parties with the management by the transactions that they do inside the company they are very much closely connected in the company and let me tell you that if a person is doing such type of transaction he is also called as executive director who is an executive director who has a day to day role to play in the company managing director means he is an executive director if Mukesh Ambani is an executive director or a managing director of Reliance Industries, he has many things to do in Reliance Industries than to do something in Tata. Because in Tata, he is not a director only. Mukesh Ambani is a non-executive director of American Express Bank. Do you know that? He is a non-executive director in American Express Bank. But he hardly goes and visits the headquarters of American Express Bank. But he is a director there. He has a passive role to play, but he has an active role to play in Reliance Industries. So whenever a company gives any loan to any party who is specified under section 301, then such parties are called as interested parties. And you have to make sure as an auditor that the party has not only taken the loan, but it has also repaid the loan on time. One last point which I want to say about the loans if they are given. See, I have not gone to taken so far. I am still on given only. It's a long story. When a company gives loan to an interested director and if the value of the loan exceeds 1 lakh rupees, 1 lakh rupees, then the company should take immediate steps for its recovery. That means according to Caro, this 1 lakh rupees is considered as a substantial amount. It's very big amount you have given a loan. Okay, so it's considered as what? It's a substantial amount. So whenever a company gives substantial loans to its substantial means what, sir? So according to Caro, substantial means more than one lakh. And whenever I use this word substantial, I sometimes feel it's a very psychological word because to make a person understand what is substantial, I have to give the meanings from different different acts. Some according to some acts, substantial means anything which is beyond 10 crore rupees. Substantial, some according to Caro, it means beyond 1 lakh rupees. So it's very difficult for me to make you understand. According to income tax, you know, if you are having a substantial interest in the business, your stakeholding in that business is 26% or more. But according to AS18, which we studied yesterday, it is 20% or more. That is why I'm saying it's a very psychological word to understand. Today in the morning I was talking about listing agreement. A company has to enter into a listing agreement with the stock exchange and it should comply with the terms and conditions of listing agreement. Do you know what that Kumar Mangalam Mirla says? That according to listing agreement, anyone who is having more than 2% shares of the company, equal to 2% shares of the company, is having substantial interest in the company. I can give you references of so many other acts which are saying, according to the takeover code, now this is income tax, now the takeover code also says, substantial means more than equal to 26%. That means whenever we are looking at these type of words, they are, according to me, they are very psychological. So you have to just see which act you are applying to decide whether it is substantial or not. So if I am saying substantial, here it means, in Caro it means, anybody who takes more than 1 lakh rupees from a company is a substantial stakeholder of the company. The company has to take immediate steps for its recovery. This should be checked by the Caro auditor. And if the person has not paid money to the company, if he has defaulted to pay money, you should write that person's name in the Caro report. Let the shareholder remove the shoe. <laughs> Have you understood or not? This Caro report is given to the shareholders. Ultimately, it's an extra report to the main audit report. Loans given. I did not speak about taken. I'm talking about given. Who is giving to whom? The company is giving to the... Under which section? You know what is the worst part of this section? It is not there in IPCC syllabus also, but they are writing it in Caro and the student does not know only what is section 301. I'll have to give you a separate note on section 301. So you'll write it later. Any loan, secured loan, unsecured loan, then the number of parties and the amounts thereof should be specified in Caro if you have given the loan. Very minute th case, but it is found. Many companies found, in many companies you will go and you will see that the companies are giving loan to its directors and especially to those type of directors who have day-to-day -day interest in the company because they keep on extracting money as if they are it is their own money it is not their director's money the money of the shareholder so you should keep record for the same whether the rate of interest and other conditions of the uh, conditions are prima facie prejudicial prima facie means at the first instance prima facie means apparently at the first instance it should be at prejudicial means what whether, whether it is harmful or not prejudicial means it should it should not be harmful 
So the word prejudicial means it is harmful. Very technical words they have used. And prima facie means at the first instance. First instance. When you see a road accident, it is a prima facie evidence. You are the prima facie person. That means you can go and tell to the police that, sir, I saw a road accident. You can file an FIR against that accident. So it's a prima facie evidence available with the police authorities. So what do you mean by prima facie? First instance. And uh, prejudicial means it is something which is very harmful. So the rate, you now tell me one thing, if the director, if the director who has taken loan from a company, if he would have gone to a bank, the bank would have given him loan at 14% rate of interest, company is giving loan only at, this is very harmful. Company is losing 10% compared to the market rate of interest. This is a loss for the company. Why don't you give loans to directors also at 14% only? Let them take loans, no problem, but give them at market rate of interest. This rate is market rate of interest. Why are you giving them at 4% only? Give them at 14%, then the director will not come to you only. He will better go to a bank and take the loan. Why is he coming? Because he knows that the company is going to give a cheaper rate of interest loan. So that is also profit plus the director may not even repay the loan. So that is super profit for the director, which should not be the case. So now, if the company has given loan, okay, now see here, whether there is a receipt of principal and interest on a regular basis or not. If the director is defaulter, irregular person, write his name in Caro report. Whether the uh, amount which is overdue is exceeding 1 lakh rupees, okay, more than 1 lakh rupees, then the company has to take immediate steps for its recovery, principal and interest both. And now it starts from loans taken. Now, loan taken is exactly the same condition as loan given. But the only thing is that this 1 lakh rupees condition will not come in the taken point. We will read it out. Loans taken from section 301 parties, rate of interest and other condition, prima facie, prejudicial to the interest of the company. Then, whether the payment of uh, principal and interest amount are regular or not. Now tell me who is taking loan from whom? The company is taking from the director. So who is more to worry, the company or the director? The director should worry whether he is giving 1 lakh rupees more loan or not. Why should the company worry? So when company is not in trouble, you should not write that thing in Caro. Because we are writing this Caro report only to safeguard the interest of company, which will ultimately safeguard the interest of the shareholders. Have you understood or not? So this, remember, uh, 1 lakh rupees condition is not for the loans which are taken. It is loans which are given. Have you understood? Please read the third point on your own.